Today we'll be reading The Interlopers by Saki. Hector Hugh Monroe was born in 1870 and died in 1916. Known by the pen name Saki, he was a British writer whose witty, mischievous, and sometimes macabre stories satirized Edwardian society and culture. That was the society at the time of King Edward in England. He's considered by English teachers and scholars as a master of the short story and offered, often compared to O. Henry and Dorothy Parker. He was influenced by Oscar Wilde, Lewis Carroll, and Rudyard Kipling. Before we read, let's look at some vocabulary. What is an interloper? The word inter means inside or into. And an interloper is somebody who goes somewhere where they do not belong or they're not wanted. Vendetta. A vendetta is revenge against someone or another family and usually violent and long-lasting, like a blood feud. What does it mean to reconcile? Remember that prefix RE means again. Reconcile means to restore relations. So if you haven't seen a friend for a long time, it may be difficult to reconcile or restore those relations, especially if anything bad had happened between the two of you. A few themes we're going to look at. How do power, property, and identity overlap and influence each other? And theme. What themes could a man versus nature conflict enhance? And think about naturalism and stories that we read, like the Scarlet Ibis and To Build a Fire that involved naturalism, man versus nature. The Interlopers by Saki. In a forest of mixed growth, somewhere on the eastern spurs of the Carpathians, a man stood one winter night watching and listening, as though he waited for some beast of the woods to come within the range of his vision, and later of his rifle. But the game for whose presence he kept so keen an outlook was none that figured in the sportsman's calendar as lawful and proper for the chase. Ulrich von Gradwitz patrolled the dark forest in quest of a human enemy. The forest lands of Gradwitz were of wide extent and well stocked with game. The narrow strip of precipitous woodland that lay on its outskirt was not remarkable for the game it harbored or the shooting it afforded, but it was the most jealously guarded of all its owner's territorial possessions. A famous lawsuit in the days of his grandfather had wrested it from the illegal possession of a neighboring family of petty landowners. The dispossessed party had never acquiesced in the judgment of the courts, and a long series of poaching, affrays, and similar scandals had embittered the relationships between the families for three generations. The neighbor feud had grown into a personal one, since Ulrich had come to be the head of his family. If there was a man in the world whom he detested and wished ill to, it was George Zanum, the inheritor of the quarrel and the tireless game snatcher and raider of the disputed border forest. The feud might perhaps have died down or been compromised if the personal ill will of the two men had not stood in the way. As boys, they had, their, they had thirsted for one another's blood. As men, each prayed that misfortune might fall on the other. And this wind-scourged winter night, Ulrich 
had banded together his foresters to watch the dark forester. Not in quest of four-footed quarry, but to keep a look at, out for the prowling thieves whom he suspected of being afoot from across the land boundary. The roebuck, which usually kept in the sheltered hollows during a storm wind, were running like driven things tonight, and there was a movement and unrest among the creatures that were wont to sleep through the dark hours. Assuredly, there was a disturbing element in the forest, and Ulrich could guess the quarter from whence it came. He strayed away by himself from the watchers whom he had placed in ambush on the crest of the hill, and wandered far down the steep slopes amid the wild tangle of undergrowth, peering through the tree trunks, and listening through the whistling and skirling of the wind, and the restless beating of the branches for sight and sound of the marauders. If only on this wild night, in this dark, lone spot, he might come across George Zanum, man to man, with none to witness. That was the wish that was uppermost in his thoughts. And as he stepped round the trunk of a huge beech, he came face to face with the man he sought. The two enemies stood glaring at one another for a long, silent moment. Each had a rifle in his hand. Each had hate in his heart and murder uppermost in his mind. The chance had come to give full play to the passions of a lifetime. But a man who has been brought up under the code of restraining civilization cannot easily nerve himself to shoot down his neighbor in cold blood and without words spoken, except for an offense against his hearth and honor. And before the moment of hesitation had given way to action, a deed of nature's own violence overwhelmed them both. A fierce shriek of the storm had been answered by a splitting crash over their heads, and ere they could leap aside, a mass of falling beech tree had thundered down on them. Ulrich von Gradwitz found himself stretched on the ground, one arm numb beneath him, and the other held almost as helplessly in a tight tangle of forked branches while both legs were pinned beneath the fallen mass. His heavy, shoot, his heavy shooting boots had saved his feet from being, being crushed to pieces, but if his fractures were not as serious as they might have been, at least it was evident that he could not move from his present position till someone came to release him. The descending twig had slashed the skin of his face and he had to wink away some drops of blood from his eyelashes before he could take in a general view of the disaster. At his side, so near that under ordinary circumstances he could almost have touched him, lay George Zanum, alive and struggling, but obviously as helplessly pinioned down as himself. All around them lay a thick strewn wreckage of splintered branches and broken twigs. Relief at being alive and exasperation at his captive plight brought a strange medley of pious thank-offerings and sharp curses to Ulrich's lips. George, who was early blinded with the blood which trickled across his eyes, stopped his struggling for a moment to listen and then gave a short, snarling laugh. So you're not killed, as you ought to be, but you're caught anyway, he cried. Caught fast. Oh, what a jest, Ulrich von Gradwitz snared in his stolen forest. There's real justice for you, and he laughed again, mockingly and savagely. I'm caught in my own forest land, retorted Ulrich. When my men release us, you will wish, perhaps, that you were in a better plight than caught poaching on a neighbor's land. Shame on you. George was silent for a moment, then he answered quietly, Are you sure that your men will find much to release? I have men, too, in the forest tonight, close behind me, and they will be here first and do the releasing. When they drag me out from under these damn branches, it won't need much clumsiness on their part to roll this massive trunk right over on the top of you. Your men will find you dead under a fallen beech tree, for form's sake, I shall send my condolences to your family. 
It's a useful hint, said Ulrich fiercely. My men had orders to follow in ten minutes' time, seven of which must have gone by already, and when they get me out, I'll remember the hint. Only as you will have met your death poaching on my lands, I don't think I can decently send any message of condolence to your family. Good, snarled George, good. We fight this coral out to the death, you and I and our foresters, with no cursed interlopers to come between us. Death and damnation to you, Ulrich von Gradwitz. The same to you, George Zanum. Forest thief, game snatcher. Both men, both men spoke with bitterness of possible defeat before them, for each knew that it might be long before his men would seek him out or find him. It was a bare matter of chance which party would arrive first on the scene. Both had now given up the useless struggle to free themselves from the mass of wood that held them down. Ulrich limited his endeavors to an effort to bring his own partially free arm near enough to his outer coat pocket to draw out his wine flask. Even when he had accomplished that operation, it was long before he could manage the unscrewing of the stopper or get any of the liquid down his throat. But what a heaven-sent draft it seemed. It was an open winter, and little snow had fallen yet. Hence the captives suffered less from the cold than might have been the case at that season of the year. Nevertheless, the wine was warming and reviving to the wounded man, and he looked across with something like a throb of pity to where his enemy lay, just keeping the groans of pain and weariness from crossing his lips. Could you reach this flask if I threw it over to you? asked Ulrich suddenly. There's good wine in it, and one may as well be as comfortable as one can. Let us drink, even if tonight one of us dies. No one can scarcely see anything. There's so much blood caked around my eyes, said George. In any case, I don't drink wine with an enemy. Ulrich was silent for a few minutes and lay listening to the weary screeching of the wind. An idea was slowly forming and growing in his brain, an idea that gained strength every time he looked across at the man who was fighting so grimly against pain and exhaustion. In the pain and languor that Ulrich himself was feeling, the old fierce hatred seemed to be dying down. Neighbor, he said presently, do as you please if your men come first. It was a fair compact, but as for me, I've changed my mind. If my men are the first to come, you shall, be, you shall be the first to be helped, as though you were my guest. We've quarreled like devils all our lives over this stupid strip of forest, where the trees can't even stand upright in a breath of wind. Lying here tonight thinking, I've come to think we've been rather fools. There are better things in life than getting the better of a boundary dispute. Neighbor, if you'll help me to bury the old quarrel, I'll ask you to be my friend. George Zanum was silent for so long that Ulrich thought perhaps he had fainted with the pain of his injuries. Then he spoke slowly and in jerks. How the whole region would stare and gabble if we rode into the market square together. No one living can remember seeing a Zanum and a von Gradwitz talking to one another in friendship. And what peace there would be among the forester folk if we ended our pew tonight. And if we choose to make peace among our people, there's none other to interfere, no interlopers from outside. You would come and keep the Sylvester night beneath my roof. And I would come and feast on some high day at your castle. I would never fire a shot on your land, save when you invited me as a guest. And you should come and shoot with me down in the marshes where the wild fowl are. In all the countryside, there are none that could hinder if we will to make peace, I never thought to have wanted to do other things and hate you all my life. But I think I have changed my mind about things too this last half hour, and you offered me your wine flask, Ulrich von Gradwitz. I'll be your friend. For a space, both men were silent, turning over in their heads this wonderful change that this dramatic reconciliation could bring about. In the cold, gloomy forest, with the wind tearing in fitful gusts through the naked branches and whistling round the tree trunks. They lay and waited for the help that would now bring
bring release and succor both parties. And each prayed a private prayer that his men might be the first to arrive so that he might be the first to show honorable attention to the enemy that had become a friend. Presently, as the wind dropped for a moment, over it broke silence. But shout for help, he said. In this lull, our, vo our voices may carry a little way. They won't carry far through the trees and undergrowth, said George, but we can try together then. The two raised their voices in a prolonged hunting, prolonged hunting call. Together again, said Ulrich a few minutes later, after listening in vain for an answering hello. I heard nothing but the pestilential wind, said George hoarsely. There was silence again for some minutes, and then Ulrich gave a joyful cry. I can see figures coming through the woods. They're following in the way I came down the hillside. Both men raised their voices in as loud a shout as they could muster. They hear us. They've stopped. Now they see us. Now they're running down the hill toward us, cried Ulrich. How many of them are there? asked George. I can't see distinctly, said Ulrich. Nine or ten. Then they're yours, said George. I only had seven out with me. They're making all the speed they can, brave lads, said Ulrich gladly. Are they your men, asked George. Are they your men, he repeatedly impatiently, as Ulrich did not answer. No, said Ulrich with a laugh, the idiotic, chattering laugh of a man unstrung with hideous fear. Who are they, asked George quickly, straining his eyes to see what the other would gladly not have seen. Wolves. Symbols are everywhere. We have peace signs and yield signs and stop signs when one, rep one thing represents another. First, let's look at the rifles. The rifles represent the threat of death. The intention was hunting game, not <clears throat> other men. The men intended to shoot each other. The feud has corrupted their ambition and actions. And control of the rifles does not mean control of nature. The beech tree. Despite being armed to shoot, a falling tree is what nearly kills them when they come face to face. The tree prevents either man from using his rifle. This shows the random power of nature and how it doesn't abide by man's feuds or allegiances. Nature teaches the two men a lesson about their limited power. Wolves. The wolves demonstrate the power of nature again and its disregard for the men. Both Ulrich and George were convinced that whoever's group was first to arrive would kill the other. After their reconciliation, the men believed that the first group of foresters would save the former. In the end, the first to show up was nature represented by the wolves. Character Traits Both men place importance on controlling territory, the forest, and seeking revenge upon each other. Physical appearance. Both men are rugged Eastern Europeans, prepared for hunt and prepared for physical violence against each other. They're wealthy landowners in winter. Personality traits are greedy, self-centered, and vengeful. The relations to others, they both lead large groups of men to hunt. They're determined to win this family feud. Important quotations. And each prayed a private prayer that his men might be the first to arrive, so that he might be the first to show honorable attention to the enemy that had become a friend.
and before the moment of hesitation had given way to action, a deed of nature's own violence overwhelmed them both. A great deal of importance was placed on winning. Both men are willing to kill, but fail to see that nature is most powerful. Property. They're feuding over property at the expense of peace and the well-being of nature and their families. 